As we come now to celebrate Holy Week, we call that week the Holy Week, right? What makes it holy? What makes it holy is the story that it tells, right? The story of the last days of Christ on the planet. Uh, in a sense, the completion of that particular moment of salvation history that continues after Holy Week. Holy Week is a time to, in a sense, zero back in to the events that unfolded that were the fulfillment of the promise of God of salvation for his people. And, and it's incarnated in this person of Jesus Christ and, and the mystery that will unfold during Holy Week. So what unfolds during Holy Week and makes it holy is actually the very mystery we contemplate. We contemplate the dying and the rising of Christ and the events that led up to that, that really lie at the foundation of what it means to be Christian. To, to be Christian ultimately means that we believe that God became man in the person of Jesus Christ and that he gave his life for us and that that life, even in the midst of death, then rose. So it, it, is, a, it is a week that's holy by the hopeful message and the hopeful events that unfolded that week, powerful events that have, have changed humanity and have changed eternity for each of us. Holy Week begins with Palm Sunday, right? It's so well known among uh, Catholics and Christians all over the world. It begins with the triumphant entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem uh, to celebrate the Passover. As a Jew, Jesus was going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. But he celebrates then the ultimate Passover, the ultimate uh, intervention of grace and eruption of grace in history and humanity. Uh, so the first few days of Holy Week, beginning uh, Sunday with Passion Sunday, they call it, really focuses us on what is the passion of Christ. Well, at one level, the passion of Christ is his suffering and death on the cross. At a deeper level, his passion is actually you and I. He has a passion for us. He has a love for us. He said that there is no greater love than the love of a friend who lays down his life for his friend. And, and so that's what we celebrate. That's what we recall. That's what we meditate. That's what we contemplate. Uh, then Thursday begins the sacred triduum. A beautiful time. Here in Philadelphia, we, we celebrate the Chrism Mass on Holy Thursday, where we celebrate the priesthood, the institution of the priesthood. Our, our priests come by the hundreds to the cathedral. We renew our, our ordination promises, our priestly promises that day. Um, we celebrate that evening, it was the be formal beginning of the Triduum with the Mass of the Lord's Supper, uh, commemorating, bringing back to memory, celebrating again, the gift of, of the Eucharist, the gift of the priesthood, and how all that is rooted in, in love and charity, the washing of the feet that Jesus does. And, and that's wonderful question that he asked the apostles that day and us, do you understand what I'm doing? You know, what I'm doing is I am, I am washing your feet. I'm washing all of you of, of sin and, and evil and hatred, and I'm washing it through my love, and we will see that on Good Friday, what that love actually looks like. That love looks like a man who gives his life on the cross and, and sheds his blood for you and for me. It then talks about and moves us towards the other part of that Paschal mystery, that Jesus died, but Jesus rose. And, and that lies at the very center of what it means to be Christian, right? That we believe that, to put it bluntly, that a dead man came back to life. And, um, and that's a source of great hope. I think all of them, all those moments are, are inspiring and powerful for me. Uh, as a Philadelphia priest, the prison mass was very beautiful uh, um, and, uh, and, and very affirming of the gift of the priesthood in, in all of us. And, and the washing of the feet, uh, very moving very moving and, and also very moving to me is that moment uh, where we do the procession and, and, we, and we pose a blessed sacrament and we are called to pray. As, as the apostles were asked by Jesus, pray. And, and it, it kind of places us back in Gethsemane, 
where Jesus goes to pray and we go with him to pray. And, and, uh, and our churches remain open till later that night and of, of just silent, silent prayer uh, that moves us into the beauty of, of Good Friday, moving, quiet, sad. But it's a sadness that is wrapped in, in hope because we know the end of the story. The story did not end on Good Friday. And our Good Fridays don't end on Good Friday either, right? Our sufferings don't end just in suffering. They're always wrapped in hope. That's, that's the heart of, of, of the Christian. And of course, the beautiful Easter vigil, right? That begins in darkness. Uh, and we bless the fire, the Easter fire, and we, we light that big, candle, the Paschal candle that represents the light of Christ, that even in the midst of darkness, the light of Christ shines. But it's a light that then gets shared. And, and, and it's so beautiful to see how the candles in church begin to get lit and lit and lit and lit. And all of a sudden, the church is filled with light, but it's filled with the light that has been given to each one of us. A uh, very beautiful uh, celebration. and. And then that incredible moment where we remember that what Jesus said would happen, happened. And that he rose and that he's still among us then. And to use the words of the early Christians was, he's alive, he's here. It is a time to reinvigorate, right? We, we uh, at our Easter vigil, we're called by, by the church to renew our baptismal promises, right? And and our baptismal promises is our embracing of being a disciple of Christ. But being a disciple of Christ is also telling the story, right? And sharing the story and proclaiming that story. It is what the apostles did. They, they experienced the resurrection, but they didn't keep it as, as a secret. They went and proclaimed that. Um, but they gathered together in prayer to talk about the things that Jesus talked about and to share the vision that Jesus shared with the whole world, and we continue to do that. So simply put, if you're not going to church, go to church, right? If you're not going to church, go to church. Do what the apostles did. And so it is a time to renew that in us, uh, in all of us, and those of us who are there already, and maybe those of us who, who for one reason or another have stepped away. If we want to live this gift of, of the hope of Easter, then we have to engage the gift of the hope of Easter. And how do we do that? Come to the altar, come to the table. You know, they, they often say, you know, uh, smells and bells, right? The smell of incense, the beauty of music, the solemnity of the liturgy that tells a story. But it's not just a story of the past. It's actually a story of the present because the story that's unfolding there is also our story. What we celebrate in liturgy is really life. That includes our life. And, and so as a, as a child, as a seminarian, as a young priest, I was awed by the celebration itself that had such beauty and such meaning. As I've gotten older, I realize that that is, in a sense, our story too. That we go through our ups and downs and we go through our periods of our own personal Paschal mystery, right? Uh, our deaths and our rising, which is the, the very mystery of the baptism that we were immersed into. We were immersed the day of our baptism into the dynamism of the dying and the rising of Christ. And our whole life is actually a dying and a rising until one day we die and rise for the last time, for the last time. And so at different moments, I viewed it in different ways as my capacity allowed me to view it. Um, so it's a beautiful time, take advantage of it.